Spirit of Jesus, we ask you and we invite you. We give you permission to search our hearts. We give you permission to reveal to us the things that we may not want to see about ourselves. That you would, um, Lord, give us eyes to see. That we would no longer, Lord, be blind in to certain areas of our lives. We pray that you would open the eyes of the blind, open our eyes, especially as to the areas in which you are calling us, Lord, to give over to you, to surrender to you. And we want to be your followers. We want to follow you as you've called us to follow you. We pray that you would prepare us, Lord, to follow you for the rest of our lives. Today is the first day of the rest of our lives. So we pray that you would prepare us for the journey of the rest of our lives with you and with the body of Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, you know, as we approach Easter, the day in which we celebrate uh, his resurrection, that is so exciting as we think about the resurrection of our Savior. But um, what is more difficult is the fact that there is no resurrection without crucifixion. And so without the crucifixion, there would be nothing to celebrate. And so as this week we approach Good Friday, we approach that with humility, with sobriety, with a sober-mindedness, with a a reality of what we're being asked to do as followers of Jesus. We want to live in his resurrection, in the power of his resurrection. But we're called to suffer with him, to go to the cross with him, and to be willing to be crucified with him, to live a crucified, cruciform life as followers. That's why the question of are you a follower or admirer is such a critical question. But we recognize that the call to follow Jesus is a loving call from a loving Father. It's born out of love. And he gives us the grace, the grace upon grace to do what he's asked us to do He just asks us to trust him, to trust him for the grace that we need to follow him to the cross and also to live a life in the power of his resurrection. The the title of today's message is, Can Jesus Trust Me? Can Jesus Trust Me? And... um, you know, as, as I thought about this, and I'm asking that of myself, can Jesus trust me? Am I, am I one who is seeking him for what he can do for me? Am I one that, it, that believes, believes more about myself and has so much maybe pride in who I think I am that, that I can't, Maybe be trusted to, to follow him in the way he's calling me to follow him. And so this is a, a real question that, that we need to ask ourselves. And it comes from John 2, 22 to 23. Now, when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Another way of saying that is, but Jesus on his part did not trust them. He didn't trust them even though it says clearly that they believed in his name when they saw the signs. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. He created man. 
He is the creator of all things. He knows what is in each of our hearts. And so the question that we ask ourselves is, can Jesus entrust himself to me? Can he trust me with the gospel? Can he trust me with the call to follow him? Am I one who is believing in him because of the things that he's done? Because of the great works that I've heard about? Because of the things that I've seen? And so my belief is based on his works. But I, am I one who is also willing to trust him and follow him along the way where he's leading me? And, and so at the outset of his ministry, there were many who followed him because of the great and wonder, great signs and wonders that he did. But many of them left him later on in that three-year ministry. In John 6, Jesus was talking to the people and he said, I tell you the truth, the reason why you were looking for me, the reason why the multitude and the crowds were trying to find him, he says, why you're looking for me is not the miracles. You are looking for me because I gave you plenty of bread to eat. Because I gave you what satisfied your cravings. And you want more of that. You want the bread that satisfied your physical appetite more than you want the bread of life. More than you want the manna from heaven that only God can provide. And so he said, I know you, I know man, I know what is in you. As long as I give you what you want and what you think you need, then, then you'll follow me. But the question is, will we the question is, why are we following Jesus? Why do we follow him? What are we seeking? You know, as we talked about, as Pastor Reynolds talked about the, the spiritual disciplines and the things that we really need to do, the gospel is obviously is, is a gospel of grace. We are saved by grace, not by works. But the gospel is not opposed to work. <clears throat> that we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are saved by grace, but we are sustained by works, by the works that we do. Our work, we're called to follow him and to, and to do the things that we need to do to draw closer to him. And we ask for grace to do those things. And he gives us the grace. I mean, I could tell you, I could tell you from firsthand experience that as Randall was talking about, you know, this times of silence and solitude, times of alone with being alone with God. It's so hard for us because that alarm clock goes off and we don't want to wake up. If it's early, we'd rather go back to sleep and we just want a, this comfortable bed. It's like, feels so good. I just want to stay here. But I can tell you that when we take that first step and we say, I've set my alarm to spend time with Jesus and now I'm going to get out of bed. As soon as you do that, so often I have been so sleepy and tired, I don't want to get up. But as soon as I step out of bed, saying I'm going to go spend this time with the Lord, it's amazing. I wake up. It's like now it's just like, boom. It's like, okay, you got it because all you, you took that step. It's like, it's like the five loaves and two fish. You brought what little you had and I multiplied it. But you still had to bring the five loaves and two fish. And so, so the question is, <clears throat> Why are we following Jesus, and are we willing to do the hard work that's required to really see Jesus? Because you understand the prize of seeking Jesus, the prize of really pursuing him and, and doing these things, is at the end of the day we get Jesus. At the end of the day, we just get more of Jesus. And that's what we long for. He, he is waiting for those who are willing to seek him. And as we seek him, we get more of him. And that is the question that we ask ourselves. Why are we following Jesus? For his ways or his works? Am I willing? Am I seeking him for him? For his ways and not just his works. So as we consider Palm Sunday and we... Uh, Consider the events of that day. Look at Luke chapter 19. And it says, And as he rode along, Jesus, 
they spread their cloaks on the road as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples. And remember, disciples as followers of Jesus. So these are those who have put themselves under, according to Luke, Jesus as their rabbi. And so the, there's a whole multitude of them, and there's a multitude of his disciples that they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, quote, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. In Mark, Mark uh, 11, verse 9, he says, And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. John, in John chapter 12, verse 17, he says, The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him and why they were cheering and celebrating him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So we get the picture of they're all along the road with palm branches and they're celebrating the coming of their king. They, they know the prophecy in Zechariah. They know that their king, their Messiah, would, become, would come riding on a colt, a donkey. And here, they, those who were followers said, yes, he is our Messiah. But many of them, the, the deliverance that they sought was a political deliverance. They sought the deliverance from the Roman authorities, from the bondage of Rome. They sought deliverance from the religious leaders. And they believed that Jesus would actually sit on a throne, an earthly throne, and be like King David and rule from an earthly throne at that moment in time. That's what they sought. And they believed that this was him and that he was about to initiate his kingdom kingdom and his reign on earth. And why? Well, they had just, John tells us, they had just seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. I mean, this wasn't a situation where, you know, he was at the, on the hospital table or the, 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 the surgical table and he just, his heart stopped. And then so they prayed or revived him after five or 10 minutes. Remember, Lazarus had been dead, dead four days. I mean, his sister said, but Lord, when Jesus said, remove the stone, there'll be a stench. It's been four days. He had been dead, stone cold, dead, wrapped and buried, and then put in a tomb with a rock to seal it. And then Jesus tells them to roll away the stone in the presence of multitude of people. And Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. I, I, if we saw that, would we not be exact, do exactly what they did? Which is they then followed him and cheered him and celebrated him that yes, of course, this is our deliverer. This is the one that the prophecies were all about. The reason why the crowd went to meet him, according to John, was that they had heard he had done this sign of raising Lazarus. Remember what Jesus, what John said Jesus said in John chapter 2, where Jesus said many followed him because they believed and they saw the sign. But he didn't entrust himself to them because he knew what was in them. So this is now, imagine Jesus, he is on the colt and multitudes are waving palm branches and crying Hosanna in the highest. Great is the king who has come who will sit on the throne of David. Great are you, great are you, great are you. And they're celebrating him. I mean, how would you respond to that? How do you think you'd respond? You know, I mean, 
when you've been celebrated for some good thing that you've done, when people are, are shouting because you did such a good job and you performed so well. I mean, you know, the idea was that we, yeah, I think I did well, thank you, you know, and celebrate right along and, and just like, yeah, this is wonderful. And so, but we look and we see, how did Jesus respond to that? What was his response? You know, Luke tells us, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it and said, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. If only you knew the real peace that I bring, other than, rather than what you see, this political peace. It caused Jesus to weep. And the Greek word there is kayo. And it means to sob. It means to sob and to wail, to lament, to wail aloud. Luke says, this is how Jesus was responding. He was literally sobbing, crying. He was in pain. He was struggling. You know, the other time when we say, we read Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb, it's a different word. It's a completely different word. That word, that Greek word just means that there are tears like coming down his face. It wasn't the same weeping. Jesus was weeping as a father would weep over his lost and dead child. Remember, Jesus and the father are one. His heart is the heart of a father. And he came to draw his children to himself. And he did the miracles that would cause them to believe him, that no one would be able to deny him. But just like the children of Israel who saw the same thing, and yet at Kadesh Barnea refused to go into the promised land because they didn't trust him. They didn't trust their father who had done such great miracles. They didn't trust him. They actually said, you brought us to kill us out here and to kill our children. And here, he makes a plan to redeem them. And he sends his son as a savior to give himself to, to do these wonderful miracles that they would believe in him. And yet, even though they're celebrating, because Jesus knew what was in man, he knew what was in their hearts. He knew that within a few days, they would say crucified the same people. He was weeping. He was sobbing. Imagine how our father weeps over lost souls. How he weeps over those who don't know him, who reject him, who he loves and gave his son for. Our God weeps. Our God bleeds. Our God wants so much for his people to know him, for those that he created to know his love, that there's such love. We, as followers of Jesus, we need to ask for the grace to have the same, same weeping of those that are lost that we would have feel the same way about those that are lost, that our Savior feels, how he feels, how God feels, the Father. Jesus was not celebrating with them. He was weeping. His ways are his works. What do we seek? Him for him? Or him for what he can do? For us or for you. Jesus wept because he knew what they did not know. 
He knew them better than they knew themselves. He knew that he knew that despite their outward public worship, they would ultimately reject him in his ways, in his father, in his ways. This caused Jesus to weep bitterly. He knew what was in man. He knew that what they wanted were his miracles. They wanted his works, not his ways. This caused Jesus to weep over them bitterly. This caused him to sob. His heart was literally broken over their worship. Their worship of him pained him. It was not in every situation genuine. They would reject him, and he knew it, and that caused him great pain. What did he know that they didn't know? Luke tells us and goes on, and he says that Jesus wept, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. The peace they sought was not the peace they needed, and the only peace Jesus was offering, peace with God, peace with his Father. But the peace that Jesus offered was not earthly peace. It was everlasting, true peace is what he offers to every one of us. Every one of us who says yes to him as Lord, who says yes, I will follow you. And Jesus knew that they would reject him and therefore miss out on true peace. Peace. Luke goes on and says, but now Jesus said, as he was weeping, he continued, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear down to the ground you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Why were they hidden from their eyes? What Jesus is referring to is what actually takes place within about 30 years in 70 AD. And that is that Rome comes and actually destroys Jerusalem. Sets a siege around the city. And then begins to attack the city and kills every man, woman, and child within the city and then burns the temple to the very ground. And, be, and because of the gold that was in and around the stones that built the temple, they removed every stone to remove the gold that was in it. And so every stone was removed. And Jesus knew that this was going to happen. And he knew that this was going to happen because... They had rejected him, their Messiah. They had missed. They did not know the time of their visitation, their visitation by the very Son of God. But he talks about things being hidden from their eyes. Do you remember the story in John 9 where the blind man who was, who was blind from birth, how Jesus heals him and he can see. And they ask him, who healed you? And he says, well, this man, but I don't know who he is. And they said, well, was he a prophet or what is he? And what do you say about him? And he's like, well, you know, he must be a prophet because, you know, nobody could do the things that, that he did unless he were from God. And, and he gets excommunicated and kicked out of the church because he, he's saying those good things about Jesus. Well, Jesus meets with him later. And Jesus asks him in John 9, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered and he says, and who is he, sure? that I may believe in him. This is the man that had just been healed and we could now see. And Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He went from, he's just a prophet and a healer to Lord, you are Lord. You are the son of the living God. You are the son of man that Daniel spoke about in the book of Daniel. And he worshiped him and followed him. Though he was blind, he ultimately saw clearly. But Jesus goes on, and he talks about those who believe that they saw clearly. And he said those who believe they saw clearly were the ones who, in fact, were actually blind. He says, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see me and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. 
they believed, based on their pride, that they knew and they could see what was needed and that they could see that Jesus was a false prophet. And they were blind because of their blindness, even though they could physically see. They were blind in their soul and their spirit that they brought judgment upon themselves. So what we have to ask ourselves just humbly is, Lord, help me to see what you want me to see about myself. It starts with me. Help me to see what you want me to see about me. Open my eyes that I would see clearly what you want me to see about about myself. So Jesus on that day, he, he wept. But he had followers, didn't he? He had his disciples, the 12, the apostles who were actually close and following him. And, and, and sure enough, most of us would say, well, even though the others ultimately would say crucify him and not betray him and not, and not abandon him, surely the 12 would not. Well, we know Judas. Clearly Judas does, and we know that. But who else of the 12? Who else betrayed Jesus and actually denied him three times? But Jesus still trusted Peter. He still trusted him. And he trusted him before and after his betrayal. Peter, we know the story. Peter had, was a fisherman and been called to follow Jesus and followed him for three years. He saw every miracle that Jesus did. He saw people raised from the dead, including, including Lazarus. He was present on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured before him. Peter knew and saw everything there was to know and see. He heard every sermon from the mouth of Jesus for three straight years. And yet, Peter cursed Jesus to his As we think of Peter, as we think of that follower of Jesus, we can relate to him. We can relate to him. We can relate to the fact that he slept in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, can't you just stay awake and pray with me for one hour at this very time? He fell asleep during that time. And here, when Jesus tells him that you will betray me three times, he says no. And in fact, tries to prove it by cutting off one of the captor's ears says, see, I'll die for you. And Jesus said, no, you won't. You're still going to betray me. I mean, this is what Jesus said to him. Simon, Simon. And this is before Peter betrays him. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. So here is the son of God battling with the devil. And the devil is demanding to have Peter that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, when you have turned again, meaning he knows that Peter was going to betray him, but when he turn again, Peter, strengthen your brothers. And Peter is being really dressed down in the presence of all the 12 and is probably saying... No, and he does. Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. I mean, how many of us have been there? And we say, I will die for you, Lord, (coughs) but I won't speak to my neighbor about you. (laughs) That scares me. But dying for you, I will do. And so it, it, and here is Peter just acting like the most of us would (coughs) and, 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 declaring that he is a follower and a leader and he would never deny. And Jesus goes on, doesn't leave him alone. He says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. But Jesus also knew that Peter would turn again. When you turn again, when, when you repent, And you turn again, strengthen your brothers. And, but Peter did turn eventually, but Peter didn't turn first. 
Peter wasn't the first to turn. Luke goes on and tells us, but Peter, after he had now denied Jesus two times, the third time he says, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And, and he completely said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he, in their other versions that say he cursed Jesus. He actually cursed him. To, to, he, you can imagine, Jesus was just arrested. is about to be crucified. <clears throat> Peter knows that all his followers are going to have the same fate. And he's among them. He's right near them. And so he's trying to protect himself. And now he's trying to convince them that he is not a follower. And it says, and immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. There's a devotion or a message from an 18th, 19th century pastor named Henry Drummond. And he says, there are two kinds of sorrow for sin. One is feeling sorry about our sin, feeling that, that a feeling that we have that, that we are better than our sin, that our better self is still alive to resist in the future when the lower, what the lower self has done. So we might regret the sin that we have done. But why do we regret it? Is it because of the fact that we have, we have disobeyed or hurt our loving God, or is it, are we regretting it or, or feel ashamed because I thought better of myself, and I should do better. I should be better. I should be better, and that's not really me. And so I'm so sorry I did that, <clears throat> but I know that's not really me. And so we have this sorrow for sin that is <coughs> basically saying we're better than that, but there's no real repentance, no true sorrow. It's wounded self-love, sorrow over weakness, Put to the test, we failed. Sorrow, feeling bad, we, we take that for repentance. Wounded pride. Sorry that we just did not do better. Not as good as we as others thought we would do. It's as though Peter, if the human side had looked at himself, we look at ourselves and we say to one another, you poor weak creature. <laughs> you have been, we were weak, but you're better than that. You're going to do better next time. You can pull up your bootstraps. And... But here, it wasn't Peter looking at Peter. And Peter, who was in the midst of his sin, we don't normally stop sinning and repent immediately in the midst of our sin. It usually takes some time. Peter had just cursed Jesus the third time, denied him, and then it was the Lord that looked and turned and looked. True contrition happens when God turns and looks at us. Human sorrow is us turning and looking upon ourselves. It's not wrong, but it can be a danger. We can miss feeling deeply our human helplessness of knowing how God comes to us when we are completely broken. In the end, it is God looking into the sinner's face that matters. Looking into our faces with love. How do you think he looked at Peter? He didn't look at him with scorn. He didn't look at him, I told you so. He looked at him lovingly. Peter saw the loving gaze of his master, and he remembered what he had said. And it was that love from a father, from his friend, from his Savior, that caused Peter to immediately repent. That's what leads to true repentance. We love him because he first loved us. 
when we sin and we fail, we need to spend time with the Lord, looking into His face, His loving face, allowing His love to pour and flow over us and bring us to a place of true, true brokenness, true repentance. He sits with us in our brokenness. He sits with us in our pain, in the dirt that we're in. The prodigal son, he came to his senses at first, but it wasn't that. It was the fact that he ultimately came to his father, and it was his father's love that restored him. This is what the Lord is asking and calling us to do. Peter turned and saw the Lord looking at him in love. And that was enough for Peter to draw him to repentance, and Jesus knew he would turn. He prophesied that. He told him, and when you turn, as you, as you will, because you will see my love, that you will then strengthen your brothers. And all of Peter's life changed after that. We celebrate, we, 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 we so often talk about Peter's failures, but we don't celebrate his repentance like we should. That was an amazing time to turn on a dime like that and repent from what he had done. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring Peter. That was for our sake as well as his. Can Jesus trust me? Can we call the worship team to come on up? Um, And so what we're asking is this week, the Lord, to evaluate us, to examine us, to bring ourselves to him and know that it's in love that he's calling us and to allow his love to flow over us and to draw us into that right relationship with him this week. I want to ask, if you do not know Jesus in that way, you don't know his love for you, you have experienced maybe some of the miracles or you've seen it or you want him to do something for you, he's calling you to actually turn and follow him and trust in him. And as we trust in him, as you trust in him, he'll open your eyes, fill you with his spirit, draw you to himself, and then walk with you as you walk with him. So we're going to worship him right now, and if anybody who just says, I, I want to follow you, Jesus, I just want more of you, whether it's for the first time or it's to renew your faith, just come on up. Just come on up here, and we'll worship together. As we say, we're here. Count me among those who are following you for your ways, not for your works. And I trust that you, and by your grace, you're going to lead me through. Amen? Amen.